Well, Colorado, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, I have just a few things to go over before we get started, and the first is that this webinar will be recorded and available tomorrow on the LiveWell Colorado website. To access the recording, please visit livewellcolorado.org and select Toolbox and click on Webinars in that Toolbox menu. Um, second, we will have some time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, if possible, please let us know who your, who your question is directed to by typing into your on-screen um, chat box, and uh, we will answer all of the questions that we are able to at the very end of the webinar. Um, now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Lisa Walbert of, of LiveWell Colorado. Thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for being on the call today. I'm actually going to switch seats so I can click this around. Our objectives for today's webinar are um, to help all the participants become more familiar with the various federal food assistance programs, uh, identify some opportunities to grow partnerships between local producers and food assistance programs, to learn about some key state and local partners to help you do this, and to discuss action items to initiate and grow these programs in your community. We're very fortunate today to have an incredible group of um, real experts, folks at the state level, as well as hands-on organizations at the local level from around the state. So we are a virtual group of presenters and, and uh, are thrilled to be able to bring that, but also do ask for your patience and ask for you to please, as you have questions that come up, if you would go ahead, and as Alex said, enter them in the chat box and use the um, include the name of the person you'd like to respond to. We do have the speaker's names on almost every slide uh, to help you out with that. And the general pace of what we'll be covering today is touching on three federal programs, SNAP at Farmers Market, um, WIC in the Farm to Family Program, and the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. And you'll be hearing um, from a, a state perspective on each of these topics, and then a local perspective um, on either these programs specifically or something that is related to them um, very much on the ground efforts. So we have a beautiful group of presenters. Um, I particularly like the carrots and the asparagus. Um, we will have contact information for presenters and links to all the resources that are mentioned throughout this call in the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow along with the link to this recording. And so do know that you will get that information as you see it whizzing by on the slides. We will provide it. And again, as I mentioned, we will be doing Q&A at the end. And if you could please indicate who the question's for, that would be very helpful. So with that, I'm going to jump right into the content and hand it over um, to Shannon Spurlock of Doug and Karen Scopel of Greeley Natural Resources. And they're going to talk about SNAP at Farmers Market. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being on the call. And um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, DUG is an acronym, and it stands for Denver Urban Gardens. And I will be talking about the state perspective, uh, starting and then kind of honing down um, to more local. And I will be starting off with the fortuitous year of 2010. And Let's see, in that year, um, both the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council and the Denver Sustainable Food Policy Council were established. And when the, um, focusing first on the Food Systems Advisory Council, when that was established, that really, um, they brought one of, the main, one of the partners that was brought in was the Colorado Farmers Market Association. And that created an opportunity to really further um, joining Colorado agriculture and Colorado food insecure families. And so Colorado Farmers Market Association, which from here on out I'll refer to as CFMA, they began a conversation with Share Our Strengths. And through that conversation, they were able to collaborate and write a grant that was funded that was uh, the the goal was to help support farmers markets and be uh, a welcoming 
create a more welcoming environment for SNAP recipients and create more opportunities for SNAP, re uh, SNAP redemption at farmers market. So a $23,000 award was uh, granted to CFMA to support this effort. Um, one thing I hope that you'll really take away from this is that all of the things that have happened so far in our planning um, for the future are all because of robust partnerships. And so I guess um, a key takeaway would be notice all the different entities, whether they're state, local, um, and how they are involved. Through that Share Our Strength grant, um, that was further supplemented by our partnership with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. And they provided funds to purchase up to 10 new SNAP terminals for rural and urban farmers markets. And the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment also provided $4,800 for evaluation support. So it was important to us to get the equipment out there to make the SNAP redemption possible, as well as know what was working for us and where we needed to tweak our efforts. Um, additionally, the Colorado Department of Human Services, through federal funding, uh, has been able to provide um, They've been able to lease wireless terminals to markets at no cost and been able to fund the monthly service and transaction costs for SNAP. So all these partners came together um, to start making progress towards increased SNAP redemption at farmers markets throughout the state of Colorado. An additional outcome was that the Shared Strength Grant enabled the creation of two primary work groups. One was outreach and education, and the other was evaluation. And both groups included state partners and member markets and people coming together to adopt a plan um, to look at new collaborative practices and figure out how farmers markets can be more of an accessible and more valuable resource for those families who are food insecure in Colorado. Um, so I'm going to move ahead to the next slide. On this first one, though, you can see um, the beginning of 2012, where the $23,000 was received. And so <clears throat> through these partnerships and the efforts that are going at the state levels, municipal levels, and regionally throughout Colorado, these efforts were able to then be funneled back through the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council. And in 2012, they were able to make a formal recommendation to the state legislature. Um, and I won't read that. You can see that on your screen. But so increasing SNAP access and direct market sales was, um, I would say, institutionalized at a broader level, which is a key outcome from these efforts. Additionally, um, in 2010, when the Food Policy Council was created, they were tasked with creating policy and advisories that address um, food systems at a broader level, but focusing more on the city and county of Denver. And one of their policy priorities was increasing SNAP redemption opportunities at farmers markets. So uh, at this point, as both groups are working through uh, increased SNAP redemption, there is a serendipitous relationship uh, forming between the partners of the Share Our Strength Grant, CFMA, the Food Policy Council members, and the subgroup of the Food Policy Council that had really chosen to promote um, SNAP redemption as a priority. And let's see, move on here. You can see, let's see here. So I'm going to move on one more slide. Um, because this, what, so what the Food Policy Council um, has done in partnership with other organizations. And my last two slides are really, um, they're after this, but I'll bring those up in a minute. They're going to highlight some of our partnerships. But we worked with existing efforts. Um, Denver Urban Gardens has youth farmers markets in the city and county of Denver with the EBT machines. And we worked with volunteers to map out uh, access points where we felt there was a target audience who would be able to take advantage of um, SNAP redemption opportunities at farmers markets 
And so you can see a map here that was done for the Five Point Farmers Market, Movetta Green, um, as well as there's an insert there from what, a picture of one of our youth farmers markets. And through this effort, we started mapping um, outreach points. All these outreach points actually came from a partner at the USDA that was initially brought in through the Share Our Strength grant. So there's the beginning of some of our partners. Um, but right now, so that's, that's the background and um, where we are now. The updates um, are that CFMA is continuing to support farmers markets and is looking at partnering with the Food Policy Council to take a municipal work plan and expand it to be replicable and scalable and address the needs of farmers markets throughout the state of Colorado. And um, there has been, last year there was a 19% increase of markets offering SNAP redemption opportunities. And in addition, um, we are continuing to move forward and develop our partnerships and bringing in new partners at the state and federal level. I'm happy to answer questions and go further into detail, but right now I'm going to pass it off to Karen Scopel to talk about what this has looked like at the, in Greeley. Great. Thank you, Shannon, and um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. I don't feel like I'm an expert at all. And I'll apologize right up front, I'm getting over a cold, so hopefully I'll get through this without um, too much trouble. Um, so um, as you can see here of this on this first slide, um, the Greeley Farmers Market has been in existence just over 20 years. We celebrated our 20th uh, birthday um, in 2012. And uh, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, we actually uh, began accepting SNAP in 2007, as well as debit cards. This was thanks to um, Colorado Farmers Market received an FMPP grant from the USDA uh, that enabled um, uh, CFMA to provide terminals and other resources to member markets. The other resources include coupons, and you'll see a shot of those on another slide. So that first year, we had um, just over $1,200 in SNAP benefits redeemed at the market, which we felt was very successful. And next slide. Uh, this is just kind of a quick shot to kind of show you, um, like anything, even overall market sales, um, you'll, you'll see a variety um, over the years of up and down. You see that we peaked in 2009 um, and actually have, have um, had a, quite a decrease in 2011. We had that market overall, and a lot of that, I think, was kind of related to um, the economic times that we were going through here. And um, so even struggling to get folks um, that have food stamp benefits um, uh, hooked up and, and uh, purchasing at the market. But we did see an increase last year. Um, next slide. Um, so obviously one of the you know, main things we wanted to do was to um, provide even more access to fresh produce for um, the folks in our community uh, that need it. And, and I didn't create it on a slide, but I went back and looked at um, some information I put together for the Wholesome Wave uh, grant that we applied for. Uh, that just showed that um, per capita income in Greeley um, uh, is quite low. It, um, maybe not as low as other areas of the state, but for the Front Range, uh, Northern Front Range, it's fairly low, uh, just around $21,000. And we have 13.3% of our families below poverty level and 216 of individuals below poverty level. So we felt like we had quite a market here, an opportunity to reach out to uh, more of those folks. In, uh, late, in 2011, um, Cindy Torres, who was our executive director for CFMA at the time, was contacted by Wholesome Wave. They were looking for a couple of markets where they could pilot their program here in Colorado. And uh, so Cindy hooked them up with uh, Doug and with us. And uh, we were able to secure a $20,000 grant from them very late in 2011, so we actually didn't do any implementation in 2011. Um, but this um, whole program is geared at um, increasing the benefits uh, above and beyond what they can get with their federal benefits uh, by doubling their value. We can go to the next um, slide. 
So um, through the grant, uh, we were able to, funding helped us uh, develop the program and do our outreach. So um, you'll see here the Snap It Up logo. This was one of the things that we came up with to uh, brand our program. And this is actually um, available and shared by any um, um, CFA, CFMA market in Colorado that wants to do a double uh, value coupon program. They um, can use this. Uh, the logo design was actually paid for um, through Share, the Share Our Strength grant. So obviously the big thing, and like Shannon said, is you know finding out how you get the word out and where you go with that. And so we work to identify all of our different types of social service and uh, service provider agencies and organizations to get the word out to them. And then um, instead of coming up with a separate um, token or something to use, we actually modified the SNAP coupons that we were already using uh, to work for the double value coupon program as well. But it's pretty simple. When the customers use their EBT benefits through our, um, our machine that we have, uh, we will give them double value coupons in the same amount up to $20 per transaction. Um, there has been some confusion, uh, both with customers and vendors, um, because the two coupons do look very alike, and on the next slide I think we'll have that. And then also about the eligible products um, that the double value coupons can be used for, which is strictly fruits and vegetables. So while their um, um, SNAP, regular SNAP benefits can be used for any um, eligible food product through uh, that's approved you know, by the Fed, um, the double value is only for the fruits and vegetables. Next slide, please. Um, so we do have some partners on this program. Wholesome Wave, obviously, um, is our funder for the doubling of our, of our benefits, um, CFMA. Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, actually last year when we got ready to launch our program, the machine we'd had since 2007 decided to die. So through the funding they were offering, we were able to secure a new machine. And our Healthy Well 2020, which uh, was the Live Well program, um, has been a major partner providing uh, food demonstrations at the market, showing people how to use um, the fruits and pro uh, vegetables that they can uh, purchase. Next slide. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the, the coupons, so you can see that um, they are very similar. We just did a stamp on top of the regular SNAP coupon. Uh, CFMA provides these coupons to their member markets that are offering the SNAP program. And I'm considering coming up with a different type of uh, coupon for the double value this year just to try to eliminate some of that confusion. Next slide. So just real quick statistics you can see here. Uh, we launched the program on July 18th, which is pretty much even though our market starts earlier in the spring, this is about the time we're really seeing produce coming in. Um, we issued uh, just over 2,000 in SNAP uh, benefits and uh, pretty close to the same amount redeemed. There's always a couple that people don't manage to bring in. And they uh, actually, this is through uh, the end of October, which is our regular market. Then we launch a winter market. Uh, that they can use them as well. Uh, we issued $1,600 in the double values. Again, sometimes if a client will uh, redeem $30 worth of SNAP, then they only get um, $20 in the double value because we wanted to be able to have enough available for um, everybody. Um, however, we had a lot of double values that weren't redeemed, and that's something we'll have to figure out how we can make sure that people remember they need to redeem those. Uh, through the year, we did come up with 55 new SNAP customers to the market, which we thought was really good, and overall had 138 EBT transactions, which was up um, from the prior year. Next slide. Um, this just kind of shows, and after I put this together and sent it off, I thought this isn't very good, but kind of shows how many we issued, how many were redeemed. Uh, but the highs and lows alternate between our Saturday market and our Wednesday market, so obviously Saturday market, we see a lot more use than we do at the Wednesday market, which is much smaller. And next slide. And one of the things that I'll mention on here, again, you can see this with the double value, so it followed a very similar pattern. Um, one of the things that we found was that people seem to be hoarding um, a lot of their coupons or double values and then use them right near the end of the season. So um, that's why you can kind of see that spike in how the double value coupons were redeemed. Next slide. 
So um, one of the things Wendy asked us to kind of talk about a little bit is um, challenges that we think we're facing um, or know we're facing. Um, I think one is the advocacy. And um, we need to find other sources of funding to maintain the double value program after our Wholesome Wave grant is over. So we're currently looking at those kinds of opportunities. And uh, uh, I've been talking to a few folks. And then I think the outreach is always the continual challenge. Um, you get turnover in staff at the social service agencies, and they, um, and they don't pass on the information that your program is out there, or they just get busy and they forget to tell people about it. So um, that, I think, is an ongoing challenge, and we're constantly looking at um, new and better ways to try to um, get the word out to the folks that could be um, eligible for that. And I don't know, do I have one more slide? I think we just have your contact slide. So Karen and Shannon, thank you very much for that. I think you could take on probably a two-hour webinar um, all to yourselves and not even um, including all the many, many partners that have been brought into this work. So thank you for that. And um, again, we will be providing contact um, information. We will be providing links to any websites that were mentioned uh, following this webinar. And if you do have any questions for Shannon um, or Karen, if you could go ahead and put those into um, the question box now, that would be great. So next up, we're going to talk about um, the WIC program. And I've got Sher uh, Cheryl Castle and Whitney Smith. So Cheryl, I think you're starting. Thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate Livewell Colorado for this invitation. Um, most of you are familiar with Colorado WIC. but um, as with all government agencies, we do have an acronym. It's just longer than most. The, ac the WIC is an acronym for Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. And we um, really are excited to share some of, the, some of the WIC's connections to the Food Systems Projects here in Colorado. It, it is helpful to, uh, to think in terms of two main layers for WIC. And that is the, the, the state WIC program, the structured, federally funded program um, that really includes all the regs and the rules that that, that that implies. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And there's an, also another layer, which has um, includes the local agencies across Colorado that really provide those direct WIC services, among many other services that they provide, to the client. And several of these agencies have joined with local funding partners on a variety of food system projects. And Whitney, uh, uh, Whitney Smith, the WIC Director for Summit County Public Health, is going to uh, really highlight one of those examples. OK, on the next slide, um, to give you a, a big uh, picture view of really what uh, the food systems program that, that WIC is, WIC does serve about 100,000 clients in Colorado. Um, those services are nutrition education, breastfeeding support, health care referrals, and checks that list supplemental foods. And those foods do include uh, a variety of different items, as well as fruits and vegetables. So on the next slide, um, the in 2009, the federal regs did give WIC programs across the country the ability to authorize farmers in addition to the grocery stores that we currently authorize. And we were allowed to, um, as a WIC program, authorize the farmer to take those produce checks that were new in 2009. Um, that it was a totally new connection for Colorado WIC. Um, Cindy Torres uh, of the then the Colorado Farmers Market Association joined with us from the very beginning and really helped provide in just incredibly invaluable guidance um, on this new adventure for us. So on the next slide, we'll see that um, we did conduct a pilot to start to authorize farmers. And that um, pilot was conducted in Mesa County. And the farmers were authorized in 2011. And basically the way that worked was the WIC clients could choose to redeem their fruits and vegetable check 
that listed a dollar amount, usually of $6 or $10. So they could redeem those WIC checks at any of the authorized farmers, or they could continue to redeem them at uh, authorized retail stores. Uh, ultimately, that year we did um, have eight farmers that applied and successfully completed that, the, the training and the authorization process. And we joined together with Mesa County and the evaluation branch here at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and evaluated the pilot to really determine if it was feasible to implement this type of program statewide. And if it was feasible, really what were the efficient ways to do that. We did on the next slide have um, uh, really some, some interesting findings that came out of the evaluation. The methods we used included surveys and focus groups. We interviewed WIC staff and WIC clients and farmers. And just a recap uh, really quickly of some of the major findings we did um, find that all nine aspects of farm locations, which uh, examples of that were selection or value, convenience, customer service, quality of the produce, on all nine aspects of farm locations related to those things were perceived as better or much better when, we're, when the clients were thinking about farm locations versus other food retailers. Uh, every single one of those nine aspects. The WIC clients did report a very high likelihood of shopping at a farm in the future. However, um, the redemptions were a little different than that. About 87% of the families that we surveyed did report that they knew about the option of being able to take their WIC check to um, an authorized farmer, but um, only about 2% of the eligible families actually did redeem a WIC produce check with a farmer. This is about 50 farmers out of about a potential 2,000. Um, so the WIC sales were about $471 for that first pilot year. The farmers did report um, that they had several reasons for applying, um, including they wanted to help young mothers benefit from having um, increased access to high quality vegetables and fruits. They felt like uh, government money was being used to feed people healthy food, which was important to them. And they also felt that the connection might be an investment for the future and really a way to increase um, uh, potential customers. We did also find that the authorized farmers felt the application was in, uh, very intrusive and a major barrier to applying for the program. They did, throughout the process, um, report frustration with uh, the rules and the training um, that were requirements, um, because we are, again, federally funded. There was some confusion at the, um, the selling sites, which could either be a farm stand or uh, a stand at a farmer's market. There was some confusion um, among the farmers and uh, some of the WIC clients on using different types of payment methods. Uh, there was confusion among the different programs um, as it was a pilot year and it was very new for them. They did, um, we did find some interesting information as far as what we thought were going to be the uh, barriers to the clients using their WIC checks at a farm location. Um, we did find that 75% of the clients that we surveyed reported that it really was not difficult to a far get to a farmer's market or a farm stand. Um, we didn't find an overall correlation between the distance to a farm location um, as compared to a grocery store and the likelihood of visiting a farm in the future. This could be a little bit skewed um, because the communities in Mesa County are closer to a farm than a grocery store. The few families that did state that they were not likely to visit a farmer stated that the reason was because they didn't know about farms or farm, farmers markets and where they were at. So we, we really did um, 
combined with, with those other findings, it really did seem to indicate that introducing our WIC families to farmers with some detailed information on where they are and how they work, maybe even helping to get them there uh, at, to a farm for a first visit, might go a, a, a very long way in eliminating um, what was a significant barrier. For the farmers, the financial benefits appear very limited. Um, we did um, have farmers that did not reapply. And um, in fact, uh, between the 2011 and 2012, when we expanded the program to be um, across the, the state, based on the local agency's resources and the appropriateness of the area. Um, and we had Otero and Montezuma that joined Mesa County Farmers in 2012. Uh, in that 2012 redemption period, the total of the WIC checks taken by farmers was, was about $400. Um, and as of right now, most of the original farmers from 2011 have not reapplied. From the total of the two years, seven farmers out of ten have not reapplied. And we are contacting them to see if they're interested in extending those agreements. It is slowly expanding across Colorado. Tri-County Health Department and Larimer WIC um, have expressed interest in joining for the growing season for 2013. And we do have um, one farmer in each one of those areas who has applied. So that's exciting. Um, Quite frankly, the biggest success of the program was really the, the, um, the local agency staff and the farmers' incredibly gracious willingness to devote um, their hard work and their time with very limited uh, numbers of return for them. Um, so we do have to get a lot of our joy of the farm connection basically vicariously through the local agencies. And I will turn that over to Whitney for an example of a great local project. Thank you, Cheryl. So this is Whitney, and I am the local WIC director up in Summit County, and I'm going to briefly highlight what we have done in our county to try to expose more of our families to fresh, local, healthy foods. We um, have not started the farmer program since I was just a pilot in the, few, er, in the past, but we do hope to implement the farmers markets in the next couple years. But right now what we've done, if we can go to the next slide, is reached out and partnered with our community. And we've been involved with our community gardens for the past three years. This will be our fourth um, summer that we'll be involved with the community gardens. And new this year, um, our High Country Conservation Center has taken over the community gardens. And we created a summit community garden network this is just a snapshot of the um, summitgardennetwork.org website that talks about our different gardens. And WIC has a garden plot at Nancy's Community Gardens, which on the next slide we can see a picture of. Um, through our community, Nancy's is three greenhouses. And this is the day um, community of volunteers set up the gardens. And the garden or the greenhouse on your far left would be um, greenhouse number one that has 19 community plots and each year for the past four years WIC has been um, given a plot with the fees. Um, we don't have to pay the fees because we donate all of the produce that we grow to our local WIC families. If you go to the next slide, this again just kind of shows where the um, Frisco Community Garden is, which is about a nine minute walk from our local agency. In Summit County, we serve Breckenridge, Frisco, Silverthorne, and Dillon. And Frisco is kind of the central point, and that is where we have a share at our community gardens. Next slide. And what we've done with these shares is we've had community outreach, and our WIC staff helps build the gardens each year. Um, we have a very short growing season up in the Rockies. But we put the gardens together. We start working at them at the end of April, beginning of May. And we don't get water turned on until the end of May. But next slide. And then we are able to grow throughout the summer. In this picture, Mountain Roots is a local um, gardening company that has actually donated all of the starts and the seeds to the WIC plot. So you can see the logo, and that's actually the um, owner of Mountain Roots. And then the two girls are not WIC clients. We didn't have any 
pictures of WIC participants, but they're standing across from the WIC plot. And what WIC has done here is every time we harvest, we donate all of the food that we grow in our plot to our local WIC families. Next slide. One of our goals with the food is we can grow things that you can't get on the WIC checks. A lot of our participants are Hispanic, and you cannot get herbs with the WIC checks. So we like to get them exposed to things that they like. And then also, next slide. Um, provide things that they might not be used to. Cilantro is very, very common with a lot of our families, but they can't use the WIC checks for cilantro. And many of our families have never seen a purple string bean, so we can show those things to our kids. And what we have done, or where we plan to go, instead of just donating our food from our WIC plots, as we've done the past three years, this year we're in the process of putting together a policy where we can conduct our follow-up visits down in the gardens. And so what we're going to do is have one day each week where our educator will print WIC checks before the appointments and we'll actually hold the follow-up appointments at the garden and get the kids involved with watering and planting and tending to our plot. And then they'll get to take home the vegetables that they pick from our plot. And that way we'll actually have kids exposed to the process of where vegetables and fruits come from and get their hands dirty and be able to take home some of the produce that we do donate to all of our families. And with that, I'm going to turn you guys back to Cheryl. This is Lisa, and I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to jump us ahead to Leanna um, and Liza and Elaine. Um, I think that we are seeing that there's going to be a need to revisit these topics. There's incredible stuff that's happening today and still more incredible progress that, that folks are making. So um, in the interest of time, we're going to move ahead. Again, if you've got any questions, um, for Whitney or Cheryl, if you could please go ahead and enter those, that would be great. So next up, we're going to hear from Leanna Konitsky with the Colorado Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Thank you. So I'll, I think I'll probably help you catch up a little bit here um, since we're new to the whole farmers market process. But the Colorado Senior Farmers Market Program, to give you a little bit of history, is is basically kind of new back to Colorado. It had previously been operated by the Colorado Department of Agriculture from 2004 to 2007, and it had been operated in one location in Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado. And then the program was let go and um, not operated in our state until last year when we were grandfathered back into the program through the USDA. And instead of it being operated by the Colorado Department of Agriculture, it's now being operated by the Colorado Department of Human Services in the State Unit on Aging, and that's where I sit. And just a little bit of background, our State Unit on Aging is the entity in, in the state that operates and oversees the Older Americans Act new, um, programs and the state funding for senior services programs. And so the total funding that Colorado receives for the Senior Farmers Market Program is approximately 14000 and that's how much um, um, the Colorado Department of Agriculture was receiving when they were operating the program for those three years. And so when we were grandfathered back in, we came in the, at the exact same funding level that we had had previously. And we operate the program in Colorado as a bulk purchase program, so not as what would be a traditional voucher farmer's market program that's redeemed at farmer's markets. We operated a little bit differently. And I'll go into more detail, detail on that in just a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the Colorado Senior Farmer's Market Program is really a partnership between a variety of agencies. And last year, the Department of Human Services Food Distribution that is also located in the Department of Human Services, and in particular, their Commodity Supplemental Food Program, the CSFP program, partnered with us at the State Unit on Aging. And we reached out to some individuals that, that they had been working with with their CSFP program, in particular, Food Bank of the Rockies and Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. And our agencies partnered together to distribute the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program to current um, CSFP recipients. And the Senior Farmers Market Program ha is for low-income older adults at around 185% of poverty. But the CSFP program 
I believe is for 135 percent of poverty. And we chose to partner with CSFP because of the limited amount of funding that we have, $14,000. We were trying to find any way that we can to leverage with existing programs that we're currently serving low-income older adults that we could provide this, this, this program and this service to so that we didn't have to in, um, increase overhead and administration costs because there was not funding to cover that. So next slide, please. So Colorado chose to operate a bulk purchase program. And within the rules and regulations of the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, you can either do a traditional voucher program or you can operate a bulk purchase program. And we chose to go with the bulk purchase program because we thought we would be able to serve more people and really get more leverage for that $14,000 that was coming into our state versus trying to operate um, a traditional farmer's market program. And one of our uh, main partners on this, this project that then later had to drop out was actually the Colorado Farmers Market Association and Cindy Torres, who's no longer with them. But we all kind of strategized on how can we take the, the, the amount of money that we've been granted and serve the most amount of people. And the conclusion really was the bulk purchase program. And so the way that a bulk purchase program works is it's a box of fresh locally grown fruits and vegetables that is delivered at one time um, to uh, an older adult senior that qualifies for the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. And because we partnered with the Food Bank of the Rockies, who administers the CSFP program for the Department of Human Services in the Denver metro area, they were able to work with a variety of their, of their current partners that, is, that are assisting their food banks that are local growers and producers in Colorado to source fruits and vegetables at incredible, incredible price points. And so we were able to serve 1,084 older adults. And this is actual, an actual picture of one of the boxes that went out last August. And it was about 30 pounds of fresh produce, fruits and vegetables that came from locally grown or that, that were locally grown but came from uh, producers and growers here in our state. And because our funding is going to be the exact same in this fiscal year as it was last year, approximately 14000 we are going to continue to do the bulk purchase program, and it's going to be a partnership with the exact same entities with a distri distribution in the, in the Denver metro area again. And um, the main driving force or reason behind that is because of the limited funding that Colorado does receive. Next slide, please. So if you, if you have questions, my contact information is here. And I know, um, like our moderator has been saying, that um, there's going to be Q&A at the end. Great. Thanks, Leanna. We are going to hand it over to Liza Marin and Elaine Paterini um, from the San Luis Valley Local Food Coalition. Liza, I think you should have control of the slides now. Hi there, this is Liza and Elaine. We're really glad to be here and really excited to be part of all this great work that's taking place across the state of Colorado. And so um, a little bit about the San Luis Valley, for those of you who haven't been here, is that we're about 9,000 square miles uh, of high mountain valley. Um, and we number under 50,000 people. So uh, travel, transportation, and getting from one place to another and having access to good food is a challenge here. We have a lot of low-income folks. And as you can see, our poverty level is about 20.2% uh, compared to 9.3% for the entire state. And about 25% of our population is Spanish-speaking and, um, and so on. Um, a couple different surveys that we did around the eating fruits and vegetables just to you know, give us a little background on the work that we're doing. Um, the Alamosa County survey design took place and came up with uh, this, this information that Hispanics are le less likely than non-Hispanics to eat fruits and vegetables, younger people are less likely than older, and males are less likely than females. So really a targeted uh, program to young Hispanic males would be ideal. 
In addition, the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center, which is one of our partners out of the University of Colorado, um, did a wonderful local um, face-to-face -face survey with over 1,000 people with at least 250 per county. And there was a really good uh, response rate, and this is all self-reported uh, data. And so you can see, um, you may not be able to see, but the, the left, leftmost column is Alamosa, and then the other counties of the valley. And Alamosa has a higher, uh, Alamosa County has a higher um, self-reported uh, intake of fruits and vegetables. 30% say they get five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And I will say that Alamosa County, in addition to having this great program for many years that we're going to share with you, um, is also the hub of the six-county region, and there's better access to fruits and vegetables in this part of our county, part of our valley. We are the main farmers market, too. That's right. That's where the main farmers market exists. Um, we are. We do have quite a bit of food insecurity. This is Alamosa County compared to Colorado, and Alamosa County is indicative of the all six counties of our region. And so um, we began as a liberal Alamosa community, and we joined um, in with the Healthy Habits program um, along the way. And now the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition is the community um, end result of the Live Well uh, initiative here in the community. However, Healthy Habits has been um, in the community for much longer. The San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition um, develops local networks educates the community and promotes programs and policies that create an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable local food system for this region. So we have a lot of different initiatives. We work on policies to incentivize food production. We have partnerships between food assistance, education, and local food production. That's one of our big goals. Um, we do a garden in a box where we actually set up low-income families with gardens in their backyard and garden mentors for the season. Um, we created a local food guide to connect community members with uh, farmers who are doing direct marketing. We have a wonderful Cooking Matters program here, and Elaine Paterini is the uh, director of that, as well as the nutrition efforts of the Local Foods Coalition. We have, I would say, for approximately five years, had the EBT machine at the farmer's market, and I believe we accessed the same grant that was talked about in the uh, beginning of the webinar to get that EBT machine. Um, and then we work with the Department of Human Services to inform clients about the EBT at the farmer's market. And last but not least, the program that we're highlighting today is the Healthy Habits Program. And in that program, we, we replicated um, the WIC and Senior uh, Farmer's Market program that was in other states here in the San Luis Valley, doing cooking demonstrations and sharing recipes with uh, people who came to the market with their vouchers. Healthy Habits is now a committee of the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition, and it's made up of um, local health professionals, WIC, Head Start, Cooking Matters, um, Community Gardens. CSU uh, was a, one of the founding members of was WIC, and uh, South Central Seniors on the Aging, aging as well. And the Food Bank. And one of the things, we have a very vibrant uh, farmer's market in Alamosa. And one of the things I love about this farmer's market is that it's not your Santa Fe or your Cherry Creek type farmer's market where it's not high-end produce. This produce is very reasonably priced. It's grown locally. And that's a rule of our farmer's market, that if it doesn't come within a 250-mile radius of Alamosa, it's not acceptable there. So you won't find mangoes or avocados at our farmer's market. These are all fresh, locally grown. Most of them picked um, the day before. Uh, consumers can access them. Um, I think I'll skip to history in the matter of time. And so this is kind of the process of healthy habits. We, we identify the populations that we would like to support with produce vouchers. We work to obtain funding. And in the beginning of healthy habits, that came from CSU. And then later it came from Livewell Alamosa. And now, um, since the Local Foods Coalition has taken over Healthy Habits, um, we call it Healthy Habits Fresh Start, we've actually garnered all this money to support this program from community businesses and members, um, something that we're very proud of. Um, produce vouchers are printed. The vouchers are distributed. We hire seasonal staff. Um, we have a mobile kitchen, and we ready that. We invite guest chefs to do cooking demonstrations each of the 14 weeks of the market in Alamosa and also a market that we support in La Jara, which is about 15 miles to the uh, out from Alamosa. 
Um, we, hide, we feature in-season recipes of local produce and do those cooking demonstrations. We share tests, we share tapes, and then recipe cards um, are given out, and then the farmers can redeem their vouchers at the mobile kitchen and get the money back um, for what they've put out. And the populations that we served in, we've served in the past, are WIC families, um, senior senior citizen vouchers through the South Central Seniors, which which is one of the um, area agencies on the aging, um, early childhood vouchers at uh, daycare centers. The area health education has actually rewarded people who completed walking programs and that kind of thing with um, vouchers. And we think we've been talking about food bank recipients participants and Cooking Matters participants is also being candidates for potential produce vouchers at the farmer's market. This is, a, this is an October shot. Um, we, do, we go all the way to October 14th doing our cooking demonstrations. And this is our WIC director. I'm very excited about uh, people trying her recipe of, um, I believe this was a uh, raw, raw, beet, <laughs> raw beet salad this day. Okay, and then um, just to look at, uh, we got the EBT machine. It may have been in 2007 we actually got the EBT machine, but I just wanted to highlight, um, for our very small population, I'm very proud of the amount of people who are using, um, using these services. We started with 753 people in 2008, and last summer's farmer's market we had $2,752 that went to our EBT machine. And um, just to compare that to the Healthy Habits produce vouchers, which actually are almost double that. Um, they actually represent about 5% of our market sales. Uh, $4,464 were redeemed at the farmer's market last year. And um, not only is that providing access to fresh fruits and vegetables and the incredible bounty of the San Luis Valley to our low-income families and elderly, but it also is supporting the people who grow fruits and vegetables in the San Luis Valley. Okay, I'm working on going forward here. You can also see the growth in our farmer's market. Maybe I lost control here. Uh, another shot, we've, had, we've featured some young um, chefs, and we also highlight the folks who have supported the Healthy Habits booth on our chalkboard and on the back of our recipe cards. OK, I'm going to turn this over to Elaine. Um, what you're looking at here is a colorful spreadsheet. And, and what I wanted to just highlight here is that with our seniors um, program, we had $1,800 in vouchers distributed, and we had a 78% return where we collected over $1,400 in vouchers that came back to us. Um, additionally, WIC um, distributes a higher amount. Um, they put out 3,400 vouchers, and we did receive back a 62% use for them. Over $2,100 came through from WIC families. Another shot at the booth this summer. And we, in the past, the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center has been an evaluator for our project, and they did, we did pre and post surveys with um, WIC and elderly. And um, some of the results we got back is that over 64% of the participants reported using all of their vouchers. The top four barriers to eating fresh fruits and vegetables are the cost, how fast they per are perceived to spoil, that they're not convenient, and people don't know how to prepare them. And, it, and it's also important to determine why people don't use all their vouchers. And so, um, and I think this kind of applies to a previous presentation, wondering about that. Um, one, that they're inconvenient. Having to go to the farmer's market is an inconvenient activity. Two, with the cost of gas, just the transportation getting there. People who don't have rides couldn't get there at all. And then there was that uh, segment of the population who's just not interested in eating more fruits and vegetables. 30.4% um, reported trying a recipe from the mobile kitchen tasting demonstration. So just one in, that would be one in every three actually cooked the recipe that we shared. Okay. Okay, next slide please. I'm not able to advance it. 
Okay, can we go back one? Or maybe I am advancing it. <laughs> Let me see here. You do still have control, Liza. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. So um, how could cooking demonstrations at the farmer's market attract more people and highlight additional variations to preparing fruits and vegetables? And um, maybe you know a more tailored demonstration, possibly more hands-on activities. Um, getting farmers market, getting to the farmers market was inconvenient, and the cost of gas were barriers. So maybe the mobile kitchen could travel around. The $15 voucher booklets for the farmers market exposed particip participants to cooking demonstrations, new fruits and vegetables, and the senior, the senior participants improved their fruit and vegetable consumption by 12%. But cost was the issue for them. So these vouchers really meant a lot to our um, older residents. So what you're looking at here is actually um, photos from our Share Our Strengths Cooking Matters program here in the Valley. And one thing that um, we were trying to address as a barrier were the, um, in terms of eating fresh fruits and vegetables was the I do not know how to prepare them. And we wanted to take this um, incredible, what we've gotten out of the Cooking Matters program and um, marry it to our Healthy Habits program at the farmer's market and try to address that with the beauty of this program, which is that very tangible, hands-on preparation of the food. If we walk you through it and then we send you home with it, then go ahead and do it and pass it on to the other family members. And last but not least, I wanted to put the slide in here just to talk about um, a belief that people who are experiencing extreme poverty really do not have it on their radar to go to the farmer's market and learn how to cook um, better. And I do think we can never stop looking at ways to address poverty because poverty is the reason that people um, are so sick and tired. And so I just want to throw that in there. Um, here's our contact information, and we'll turn it back over to Lisa. Great. Thank you so much, Liza, Lane, and Leanna, and all of our presenters. Uh, again, just an incredibly rich amount of content. I have a couple of comments to make, so if you want to get any last questions in right now, that would be great. Um, again, just use the question box. And if there are any questions that we don't get to, we will send out an email, to, at least to the person who asks it. And if it appears to be something that's broadly pertinent, we will include our response to everyone. So please do submit your questions. And as you're submitting those questions and kind of playing on, building on Liza's comments of really the need to address poverty, um, I do have an ask to everybody to think about contacting your senators today, our senators today, though I do think we have somebody from Michigan and Hawaii on here. So really reaching out to senators um, as constituents to protect SNAP and SNAP-Ed from any cuts. There are discussions underway in the Senate Budget Committee right now that would significantly reduce SNAP funding and would completely eliminate the federal SNAP education, nutrition education program. So as exciting and important as these programs are that we've just heard about, um, that even though the local programs that are doing some things that are really um, building on local capacity really are also leveraging these federal food assistance programs. So I do encourage everybody to um, be an advocate um, and uh, as a constituent, not necessarily with your organizational hat, but as a constituent to engage there. You can find more information at livewellcolorado.org slash food systems. And I know there are a number of advocacy organizations that have um, action alerts out right now on this, but now is a very important time to speak up. Um, I have one more thank you, and then I'm going to move to the questions. Um, and that's to Wendy Peters-Mosquetti for assembling another great group of speakers to talk about these programs. So thank you to Wendy, and thank you to all our speakers. And I'm going to hand it back to Alex, who will um, go through the questions that we've received. Hi, everyone. This is Alex at Live Well. Uh, the first question comes to us from Brenda and is directed to Shannon with Doug. And that is, are you able to use SNAP per to purchase food seeds and plants, such as tomato and lettuce, from stores like Walmart and King Supers? Um, you are able to use food stamps to purchase food producing plants and seeds and there's a great website uh, snapgardens.org that can tell you more about that and it's s-n-a-p-g-a-r-d-e-n-s.org um, and that should be a great resource for you around that question. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to another question from Chelsea for Liana. Chelsea asks, did they do any post-delivery post surveying of the older adults to see what they did with the fruits and vegetables, whether they were able to prepare and use them, and did family members prepare them, how so, did they freeze it, et cetera? Uh, Liana, could you go into uh, just maybe a one-minute response to Chelsea's question <laughs> about that? Sure. Um, we did not do any post-surveying questions regarding use of the produce and whether or not family members assisted with the preparation. We do know through the Food Bank of the Rockies, because these are clients that they see on a very regular basis for the CSFP distribution, is that they felt that they received too much produce at one time. And so, like I had mentioned quick, briefly earlier, that it was about 30 pounds of fresh produce. And so that's a lot of produce for somebody to get at one point in time with spoilage and things like that. Liana, thank you for that. Um, since we're on you still, I have another question uh, directed towards you. Um, a CSFP Senior Commodity Distribution Site asks, is there any way we can get the fresh vegetables and fruit outside of the metro area? At this point in time, um, because of sequestration and some other issues with the Farm Bill, we have to implement the program this year exactly like we did last year. So this year it's staying in the Denver metro area. Great, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Our next question comes to us from D, and I'm going to abbreviate just slightly, but D asks, whether we should use local community groups and to contact and support Connect with WIC. And I'm going to ask who should we, oh, excuse me, who should we um, work with for WIC? Um, and I'm going to turn that over to Cheryl. Cheryl, could you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So, so it, she's looking to find out how to connect with other local um, community partners? Now she's a local community partner who would like to. That's okay. Who would like to connect with WIC? So do they contact local public health? Where's their, what's the right approach for that? Well, there are different local agency WIC uh, clinics, so she can contact me, and I can direct her in the right. I can point her in the right direction. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, Cindy asks a question to Liza. Did Healthy Habits participants need to complete paperwork to receive the coupons? They do not. Um, I think they sign a sheet that they receive them, and in some years we've actually required a pre and post test, but um, we try and make it as um, you know, burden, burdenless as possible. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we have no other questions waiting in the queue, so we'll just give you about uh, 20 more seconds to ask any last minute questions if you have them. Um, just a friendly reminder to everyone that may have joined us a couple minutes late, this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the Live Well Colorado website. Uh, please visit livewellcolorado.org, visit the toolbox, and select webinars. Also, we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to that recording as well as all of the contact information for all of our panelists today. Lisa, this is Karen. Uh, were there a couple questions for me? Very top. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Karen, <laughs> a question from Eric. Uh, how much money do you need to keep DBC going, and when does your current grant expire? Okay, well, our current grant, we actually were able to roll over the remaining funds from last year, so uh, we probably have enough to get us through this year. Um, in terms of keeping it going, you know, it just depends on how much usage we can get people to do. I would like to see probably a minimum of 2500 a year, uh, but I think the potential um, for growing the program is so huge that it could grow substantially beyond that if we have the resources. Great. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Brenda. What can we do who are listening to help in our communities? Brenda, I would encourage you to follow up uh, with your respective uh, legislators as we, as as Lisa mentioned, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I guess there's two levels. The one, the concerns that I mentioned in terms of the funding for SNAP and SNAP-Ed, and that's certainly engaging with your elected officials, as, um, both Senators Udall and Bennett, and then your, um, your representative. Um, and then when it comes to working hands-on within the community, 
you'll get not just the contact names, but also a lot of the resources that are listed, and trying to um, go through that to identify where, um, where there are opportunities in your community. If you're not sure, feel free to email me, and you'll have my, this is Lisa Walward, and you'll have my contact information, and we can find um, folks to connect you with within your community. All right, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, tomorrow you can expect to receive an email um, in your inbox with all of the information from today's webinar. And we encourage you to register for the next webinar coming up on April 11th. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you.